Hello, art lovers. This is Gordy Grundy with ArtReportToday.com, your worldwide arts news platform, along with the great Doppelhaus Press. We'd like to welcome you to what I believe will be an interesting and studied discussion with our guest, the highly acclaimed Lenore Mullen. Now, if any of you have questions for our speaker, please feel free to send us a chat message and we will answer those questions after the presentation. To all of our guests, please mute yourself. It is that little microphone symbol under the screen on the left. Please click that to turn it red. Our host today is Professor Antoinette Lafarge, an artist and writer with a special interest in speculative fiction and alternative histories. Today, we are here to discuss her new book, Sting in the Tale, Art, Hoax, and Provocation. Her many essays have been published internationally. Antoinette is the author of another book about an incredible feminist of the last century titled Louise Brigham and the Early History of Sustainable Furniture Design. Antoinette is a professor of new media art at UC Irvine. Today, the author will be speaking with our guest, artist Lenore Mullen, who is featured in the book. Mullen is the interdisciplinary artist and professor in the Art Media Technology Program at Parsons, the new school in New York. Most impressively, Lenore Mullen is a Guggenheim Fellow. She's an art critic and a former executive editor of the prestigious College Art Association Art Journal. As an artist, Mullen is the creator of the New Society for Universal Harmony, a fictive utopian society which we will learn more about today. Welcome everyone, Professor Lafarge, the stage is yours. Thank you, Gordy, and thank you everybody for coming today. I'm going to start with a short PowerPoint, uh, giving a little bit of an overview of Lenore's uh, work so that we have you have some visuals to carry with you in your minds while we have the subsequent conversation. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And I want to start by noting that I first came across uh, Lenore's work back around uh, 2000 via the website of the New Society for Universal Harmony, which I stumbled on. The New Society is a kind of homage to the 18th century French physician, Franz Anton Mesmer and his Société de l'Harmonie Universelle, which was founded in Paris in 1798. Mesmer believed that energy was transferred among all living beings as a kind of psychic fluid or force that has affinities with electricity and magnetism. He experimented with treatments that would conduct that energy as a way of uh, curing people using a range of techniques involving such things as water baths, uh, iron filings, ropes for channeling energy and laying on of hands. He called this force he thought he was working with animal magnetism and his techniques for controlling it became loosely known as mesmerism, a word that later became more narrowly associated with hypnotism. Mallon created her new Society for Universal Harmony as an umbrella for a new set of investigations somewhat modeled on Mesmer's, and she created a heteronymic identity for herself as the new Dr. F. A. Mesmer, this time with a PhD in magnetohydrodynamics instead of an actual MA in art history. Uh, and you can see here uh, a bust of Mesmer by uh, Franz Xavier Messerschmitt. Fictive art projects rely heavily on what I've come to think of as the cloud of authorization, a mass of details, no one of which is sufficient in itself, but which together create a convincing picture of factuality. Here I've highlighted in yellow the kinds of elements that are often in play, the professional logo, the schedule of events, uh, the activities like field trips and treatments, uh, the implication in the word grounds, that there is an actual place that can be visited, um, the fact that membership is by application and therefore, you know, special and reserved, the inclusion of written testimonials. The photos on the other pages of the website tend to convey a similar sense of realness, that this is a real organization with a real goal and a real place that can be, uh, can accept uh, visitors for treatment or uh, patients for treatment. Um, here's a couple of the uh, photographs uh, from the New Society for Universal Harmony, healing treatments. Um, as in many of the new society images, there is a kind of collision 
or collusion in these images between the documentary and the dreamlike. So you're not entirely certain when you just come across these, what exactly is being documented, but you feel that something is really happening in these photographs. Um, here are two more uh, photographs from the New Society, rituals of healing with water on the left and a ritual with pebbles on the right. Um, in the use of the tub and the laying on of hands in this right hand image, uh, you can see distant echoes of treatments originated by the uh, Franz Anton Mesmer back in the 18th century, translated here into a context that lies somewhere between art, ritual, and experimentation. Uh, Malin has noted that this project began in direct response to a time of personal trauma and that this has shaped some of the ways the project has developed. One of the strengths of this project, in my opinion, is that it examines the dark side of utopic societies and experimental medical treatments. Some of the images look a whole lot more like torture than medicine. And certainly the medical experimentation in the original Franz Anton Mesmer's time could be pretty horrifying. At the same time, we also have to take account of the fundamental dissimulation of photography, the fact that these image, what these images appear to show and what they actually show may not be at all the same thing. Fictive art projects commonly rely on the authority of the photograph while subtly urging us to question that authority. And Malin's work makes the existence of this tension exceptionally clear. Uh, here's uh, a vitrine uh, of, of photographs relating and objects relating to the new society. She's in, uh, in, exhibited the work in a number of different forms, installation with videos, photographs, manuscripts, and other forms of documentation. Um, in this vitrine of um, new society materials, we see at bottom the, 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 and a photograph has been included that's one of a series by the 19th century neurologist Duchenne de Bologna, and here's the same photograph a little more clearly on the right, uh, who's known for photographs recording experiments in which he triggered muscular contractions in some of his patients using electrical shocks. A very direct reminder of the importance of cons that consent or the lack of it plays in any form of experimentation. In 2006, uh, Lenore published a book about the New Society that includes a first person account about how she found out about the New Society and the new F.A. Mesmer and visited it as if she were a journalist doing some investigative reporting. One can learn a great deal about Mesmer and the associated history of mesmeric experimentation from this book while also being enchanted by the photographs and by a series of case reports that read more like poetic fabulations. It really is an extraordinary and wonderful book. And in my opinion, a classic of fictive art. So now I wanna to turn to the conversation with Lenore herself. Mm -hmm. um, and Lenore, I wanted to start by asking you about the fact that, um, I want to talk, ask you a little bit about the origins of the new society, what it was that led you to found a society versus creating more traditional kinds of artworks and series, the way okay. many artists work. I'd like to just, um, um, my answers go beyond conventional narrative about artist development. I wanted to share some personal information that some people would probably would not share, but I think it's important in this case. And it was helpful when I was going over this material in preparation for today, because I really looked at things in a little bit in a different light than I had 20 years ago when I did this work. So, um, uh, so uh, 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, I lost everything. A family member had died. I lost my home, my work. I stopped teaching. All I had left were good friends and some self-awareness gumption. Art saved me and I slowly began to build a new life. And uh, I was an abstract painter, but I had no intention of making abstract paintings anymore, exhibiting or selling. I moved to Battery Park City. I was alone. I sat on benches near the Hudson River, and yet I was free. I felt I could do anything. And I, was, I became interested in narrative and storytelling and history. And I began visiting uh, the 42nd Street branch of the Public Library and the New York Historical Society. History kept me company, oddly. 
where was I living? What was it about? What was the history of it? On and on and on. Okay. So I began making artist books and they were about my situation. This gets to the game-like quality of, that I really see as a game. I see, I see the New Society as a game. I, I have yet to define that, but I'm thinking about that as I'm talking. Okay, so um, I began making artist books. One was called Opportunity Knox, and here it is, a copy of it. There are a few left. And uh, it's a book of games. And these are the games, if anybody, if you can see this at all. And they were all about, they were all about uh, getting out of prison or um, you, might, you probably would die unless you played the game and won and all. And I saw life as a game and here is another picture from this. Can you hold it a little higher, Lenore? Sure, sure. Up, so the, thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. So these are, they're full of history, they're funny and they're dark. Then, um, then, uh, then there was a photo project called The Disappearance. I learned about New York City history even more and I spent you know, hours and hours and hours at the 40, 42nd Street branch of the New York Public Library. I wrote about the yellow fever epidemic in New York in 1832. And it was a really, it was a fascinating, it was a fascinating period, especially because the doctors uh, had no, and this is about healing in a way, the doctors had no inkling as to the vector of, of, of the yellow, yellow, yellow fever, which were the mosquitoes and, and the mosquitoes carrying sugar from the colony, from, from the Caribbean. They thought there was something about the humidity in the air and so forth and so on. And so, uh, and, and they lied, the, the health department lied to New Yorkers telling them that there were very few people that were sick and everything was fine. And yet people were dying and dying and dying and dying, not knowing. And it was, kind of, it was almost comical. That's something else that attracted me because they would stick large. They thought there was something about the vapors, the air, the, the humidity, and they would stick large, the medical, personnel would stick large thermometers in the ground to take the temperature of the, of the earth, you know, uh, the, the, so, and uh, so, you know, and then it, so many people died. That was, that was when Greenwich Village was formed because people escaped from lower Manhattan to go to Greenwich Village. The air was better, there were no mosquitoes, but they didn't know that. So all of this actually, all of this research somehow you know, sort of came together as the New Society for Universal Harmony, which is about somebody who is not curing anybody, but pretends to cure people and about willing participants, you know, in a kind of humorous fraud, if you want to, or, or, um, or satirical fraud, I would say. So, um, and then uh, let me see what else here. And, uh, and then uh, during, for that same research project, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks in the New York Historical Society and the New York Public, the 42nd Street branch of the New York Public Library, reading letters from sailors in the Caribbean, talking about the fever there, you know, so, and I, you know, and as a, it was about slavery, there were so many things that came up at, at when I was doing that research and the science, the cause of the disease and so forth. And I had a wonderful collaborator Alana Ryan, who's a who's now a filmmaker in LA, and I I rented this dress from uh, you know this dress that was purportedly from that period, but everyone in the street called her Scarlett O'Hara. So we had a lot of fun walking around the street in Lower Manhattan, asking people if they knew the address, this address or that address. And I have the, I have, those are they, those became photographs. Okay, so moving right along. Um, I'm sorry to be so long-winded here, but okay. Some of these projects involved magnets. There was one project called Magnetic Map, a treasure hunt. And I showed it at a, 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 a non-for-profit non -for -profit gallery called Art in General. I affixed magnets to buildings in Soho that had cast iron facades and made a book of clues called Magnetic Map. I took my wedding, my wet, melted down, this is totally true, melted down my wedding ring and made it into a pendant and that was the prize. 
and uh, and uh, it was just short of an alchemical transformation. And uh, I, I must also say that at that point, I had absolutely no interest in the art world. Um, the advice I would give to young artists today, I don't know if there's one wonderful young artist in our group. This, I saw her name, Rojuta, she's here. Hi, Rojuta. And I would say, um, don't make art for the art world. So, <laughs> so, um, so I, I, ca I cared absolutely nothing about the art world. And I, hope, and I had hoped to really open a storefront where I would heal people based on my new knowledge of what not to do. Um, and, uh, and then, and there's somebody else in the audience today who I am incredibly grateful to for so many things, Ellen Levy. And she, when she found out I was working with, ma with magnets, she casually said to me, we were walking on the streets and where she said, did you ever hear of Mesmer? <laughs> So I went to the I, I went to Bob's library. I was teaching at Parsons, and there was a wonderful book by um, Robert Darnton, teaches at uh, Harvard, I think. Brilliant book on Franz Anton Mesmer, and I read the whole book, and that that was that was it. That was it. And I began to. Um, um, it's called Mesmerism in the End of the Enlightenment. It's really something that everybody should read. If you're interested in brilliant intellectual history. And, and satiric too, because he's such a good writer. And uh, let's see what else. Okay, so moving on, uh, that's, that's my answer to, how do I, that's my answer to your question. Now you can ask me another question. And okay, we'll do, I, okay. I have to ask a follow-up then is, it's, it's, all, it's all you're saying that history saved you, but you weren't thinking about it as art. What made you start thinking about it as art again? Or did you? Not then. It was quite a bit after, not then. I, I wanted nothing to do with the art world at that point, uh, but I was an artist and my friends were artists, that was the thing. So I was naturally, it, it took a long time before uh, the art world got interested in this. I would have parties and I would make little cards of a party at the New Society for Universal Harmony. I did all these things, you know, um, re regarding my society. But I suppose eventually I began taking pictures of everybody I knew, photographs. And that, they were all artists or critics or historians. And that was an introduction into uh, the real art world. So that's, so it was, it was not, I rejected it all until, and then at a certain point, I was having dinner with my friend Pepe Carmel and he said, who's an art historian, a, a, a brilliant art historian, a modernist, teaches, teaches at NYU. And he said he was, um, he was uh, associated with some people at the Q Art Foundation. And he said, you know, would you be interested in the show? And I hadn't thought of a show. Hmm. It wasn't on my mind at that point. And then, I, and then that was the beginning of it. That was the beginning of it, the hmm. entrance to the art world. So, so one of the things that really strikes me in the photographs is that they have the quality of rituals and many of the activities, you've even talked about them, as I recall, as rituals, but now you're also talking about these games, which I find interesting. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about what these activities are that the society engages in or photographs and, and what are they entirely staged for the photographs or are there actually important rituals that happen to be photographed if you if the distinction makes sense which it might not well first okay i gave people certain parameters and then they improvised within those parameters and because and uh within those parameter par par parameters were certain kinds of gestures and so forth that might be looked on as ritualistic in the way that you're saying but i think the real answer to that is something that i, I hadn't really thought of back then but being a former art historian, I think that I was very drawn to jo the Trecento and the Quattrocento, to Giotto and his street performances and the sense of the tragic in them. And they were street performances, they were performative. There's no question about it in my mind. And when you read about street performance in Italy in the Renaissance and the, and the Trecento, 
there were troops of people who would enact the nativity. They would enact these scenes on the streets and artists would paint them. So I think I was setting something up that I could, that I could uh, take a picture of. I was setting it up and I was letting them do their thing. I was just giving them a few ideas, not even really almost unconsciously at that point, because everything I was doing was unconscious. I was just out there, you know. The photographs make the experience look very intense from the point of view of the participants. Is that an artifact of the photographs? Or would you say that these were intense experiences almost more than performances? Um, I don't think that they were intense spiritual experiences, but they were intense, they were intense performative uh, experiences, if that makes sense. And somebody came to my studio recently and she said to me, this is contact improv. This is Steve Paxton. These are martial arts. This is the idea of falling off balance. So all that stuff, all that was state. I didn't, of course I was in, living in Soho right now and I was watching those performances, but I didn't, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't part of that group. I didn't know that I was actually osmosing that 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 uh, that uh, that material, but that that's what it is, absolutely for sure. So uh, and but the thing about them is that they were improvised. I accumulated props, ropes, magnets, pipes that alluded obliquely to Mesmer's technique. I couldn't make a baquette because I didn't have the money to make a baquette. You know, I mean, I mean, I suppose I could, but I. And, uh, but in all other ways, I was channeling, I, I wrote it down here. I was channeling so-called magnetic fluid, fluid from the planets and the stars to their bodies. Uh, and, you know, and then the original Mesmer would do this, but with iron rods protruding from a baquette, a wooden tub that held magnetized water. So that, that's in essence what I was doing. And, uh, you know, uh, so that's, that, that was the nature of it. And, and they look very distressed, but they were, and this is only for us, <laughs> but they were having fun. It was cathartic. It was cathartic. Some of them knew about the tragedy. Some of them knew the, about the, knew the person who died, but some didn't. And, uh, they just, they look like they're dying and they're being killed, but they weren't. And so and they love, they, I'm still friendly with all of them. I truly am. Yeah, so truly performative. I wanna really ask you now um, about another aspect of the new society that really fascinates me. And that is the way the name and the, the location, the grounds, so many things about it reference the history of utopic communities in America. And I know that of course, oh, there's a long history of those in New York that you're interested in. Can you yeah. talk about how that history sure. fed into Sure. The new society? Yeah, it was around 2000. And uh, the very name, the new Society for Universal Harmony, which I made up before the new interest, the newfound interest in utopia came about. And it was right around then, but they, they almost coincided. It was right around then that uh, the New York Public Library had a show and I have the catalog somewhere here. Eek. I wanted to just lift it up and Hold on a sec, let me just see if I have it. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. This is the book that was published by the New York Public Library right around 2000. And it coincided with, uh, with a lot of academic interest in utopia and uh, academic in, in the arts and in philosophy and in literature. And so it all came together. And I think that's how I met you. I think you had, must've had a panel on fictive art or something in, at CAA. I did do a panel on fictive art on CAA panel. in 2002. And that's how we first met, yes. Exactly, exactly right. So then everything was utopia. And I taught a course in utopia. And, uh, you know, so uh, that became very interesting to me. And in a sense that superseded the Steve Paxton performativity of the slightly earlier work, because the new pictures that I were taking were more utopian 
they were more, they weren't dystopian, they were utopian. They were about a landscape and animals and, you know, so I, and that, I just imagined all of that. I just imagined it. Uh, you know, I had been a painter and it was so liberating to use my mind in a different way and to think and, 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 and engage history in a different way. I just was just ecstatic to do that. And then to have willing participants, friends who said, sure, I'll, sure, I'll do it with you. So have I asked, have I answered your question? Um, I think so. Yeah. Um, it's interesting also that utopias are something that have, as you said, they've come under a lot of scrutiny as well as a lot of um, critique for the, yeah. for the uh, um, idealism that lies underneath. Yeah, 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 and yeah. you're using the new society to investigate discredited ideas, right? The utopia and yeah. the idea of uh, mesmerism and healing rituals that are not necessarily based in science. And I'm wondering what is, what is it about discredited ideas that interests you as an approach as an artist? I think all of us, all of us artists are looking to satirize or discredit or change somebody's mind about something. T t convention, take convention and turn it on its head. I think that if you don't do that as an artist, you're not really being an artist. And there's a, there's a wonderful, no, I can't, Oh, here, there's a wonderful quote at the beginning of your book. And it says this, it's the foreword by G.D. Cohen. And it says, uh, it says, the, object the objective here is not to master the subject, rather it is to subject mastery to hazard. That's it. Yeah, and I like that line. That wonderful and then I have to say and I'm, we're de I'm deviating a little bit right now but I have to say that there's a wonderful show of paintings by Holbein at the Morgan Library and uh, the humanist and every painting is subverted in some incredible way like a dirty fingernail or a, a seam of a split seam and the, and the, the, these are the, these are the major players so these are historical people. And so he does that, he does that. And I, I was really astonished to see that in the context of what I'm reading about right now. So that's what we artists do. If we don't do that, you know, forget it. You look at a strawberry painted by Chardin and there's, some, there's something that is not right in that painting. That's why we keep looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. So let me just follow up a little bit. You borrowed the, I, the title, The New Society, partly from Mesmer himself his, yeah, his society, but then you have to live with a title for a while, and especially with a long running project like this, Universal Harmony, Universal Harmony. What is it that that became for you as an idea or something that you're thinking through? What, did, what, did, what do you mean by Universal Harmony? Did you dis discover what it was along the way? It was the love between individuals as a group. I've never thought about it that way, but that's what it was. And uh, not a family group, but a group of people coming together, I, th I think. And these people that I was working with had that among them, love for each other, love for me. And it was very meaningful at that time, very, very meaningful. So I, I, I've never thought about it quite that way, but that's what it was. You know, and that's why it had a reality, you know, that's continued because we're all still friends, you know, 